Hello guys, and welcome back for the February JRPG News Roundup. We start with the Falcom news and thank you to Hanske as always for his work in making this known to us. The Kuro no Kiseki original soundtrack will be released on the 9th of March and those who pre-order the first run get themselves a sleeve of Van and Grendel, which is similar to what happened with the Hajimari soundtrack. The Japanese retailers Cosper and G-Store are also partaking in some Kuro merchandise with B2 tapestries, clothing, keychains and more, which is pretty cool if you've played the game already. Curtin Damashi, another common retailer of Falcon Goods, are selling these Crow and Reen plushies with the 50 mirror coin. I believe they're quite small though, they apparently hang on curtains. The pre-order window for those stays open till the 14th of March, the link is in the description as always, but you will need a proxy since it is based in Japan. It's also worth noting some guidelines released by Falcom recently in regards to sharing their imagery specific to their newsletters. Wallpapers are sometimes sent out to those who register, but Falcom have put out a statement to not share them on social media. So if you want to get these, you'll need to register to their News Express service linked in the description. And finally, in terms of merchandise, we knew there was a third Trails figure in the works, but turns out Kotobukiya and Falcom trolled us all. We're actually getting two, this time of Crow and Risha. The Risha one is interesting, as there is an unofficial garage kit that exists already, but it's cool to see a more official version surfacing now. At this point in time, pre-order windows are yet to open. Now to the games, and we'll start with some small tidbits from Kondo in an interview right near the end of January. The first point that caught my eye was that Kuro no Kiseki will not finish in two games. We know the sequel in Crimson Sin is due out this year, so apparently there will be a follow-up after that, though whether that means the shareholder meeting will see another Trails game, who knows. And as for the New East game, which also is currently in development but yet to be announced officially, it was reiterated by Kondo that it will be a completely new take on the series. New ideas, integration of the new engine, all that jazz which we've heard before. With any luck, there might be something more on it as the year passes by, but don't expect a release for 2022. As for the first Kuro game, the Zero Field team have now completed the first pass for the translation spreadsheet. It looks like the bulk of their time is now dedicated to the editing phase along with all the routes on offer. Nayata no Kiseki Ad Astra, the Japanese version of the game, is releasing on May the 26th along with a simultaneous release for Asian markets on PC via Clouded Leopard Entertainment. Pre-ordering the game from any outlet will get you the soundtrack as a bonus, but as always there are specific bonuses as well from select retailers like this 3D Crystal of Kraya from Ebten. A full rundown is in the description. Now, I'm sure some people are aware of this, but the Steam Deck has since been released and is moving out in waves throughout 2022, such is the demand for the handheld. Now, regardless of the current Joy-Con drift that seems to be surfacing, Valve themselves have been praised for their transparency regarding the device, such as giving free reign to modders, a breakdown of the technical aspects via specialised YouTube channels, and finally a quick and simple method by which you can see if a game will run on Steam Deck, illustrated with a symbol via the Deck Verified program. Split into four areas, you have Verified, Playable, Unknown, and Unsupported, which are derived from tests conducted by Valve themselves. These tests look at overall functionality like input, display, performance and seamlessness and needless to say, you generally want verified for the game you're looking to play for the easiest route to get started. As of February the 22nd, it was stated via Noisy Pixel that no Falcon games are Steam Deck verified as of yet, at least based on Valve's official tools. Now this by no means suggests Falcon games won't be playable on Steam Deck, for example a user more experienced with the tech has stated that the likes of Trails in the Sky will initially show as unsupported because the video codex requires wine tricks in order to install the game. So there are certainly ways to get them operating, you just need to do some manual work, and I imagine these workarounds will surface over time in the way of tutorials and the like. Finally, rounding out the Falcon news, we move to the Cold Steel anime, where we received more information at the end of January. Delayed from 2022 to 2023 now, the anime has an official name known as The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel Northern War, produced by Tatsunoko Production. As the name suggests, the setting will be North Ambria and will follow an original heroine called Lavi. This was pleasantly surprising, I initially thought this was going to be an extension of the war in Cold Steel 2, but it's actually filling in a gap between Cold Steel 2 and Cold Steel 3. The Northern War itself was referenced heavily within Cold Steel 3, but we barely ever saw it outside of some still imagery. Now we're going to see how the events unfurled on screen, not to mention seeing North Ambria for the first time in a live setting. Once again, this is a land that we've only seen in still imagery before. 
I like this approach, something to expand the mythos and maybe with any luck, this new heroine will be integrated into future titles going forward, especially if the anime is popular. As for the studio, I honestly don't recognise any of the work of Tatsunoko Productions, so I'm not really in a position to judge their previous work, so that's something you can check up yourself if you're interested. Now to the general JRPG news, we start with Fire Emblem, as the Musou spin-off Free Hopes has shown its limited edition which is now up for pre-order. You're getting stuff like a map of Fodlan, acrylic stands, and an art book. Persona 5 Royal soundtrack is now available on Spotify, so you can jam out to this sick collection of tunes with ease of access. The physical version of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim releasing on Switch on April 22nd comes with bonus art cards for those who pre-order it from Amazon, Best Buy, or GameStop. A great game, and worth the purchase if you haven't yet got around to it. Now, since we are touching on Nintendo, let's go over some news regarding the company in general. Many people now know that the Wii U and 3DS eShops will be closing down in 2023. Now, we're not here to debate or talk about game preservation, as that's not the aim of the video. All I cared about was trying to find a succinct list of JRPGs to put on your radar before they potentially disappear. And Noisy Pixel had a good selection as a starting point with the likes of Etrian Odyssey and Shin Megami Tensei 4 as recommendations. Links are in the description for that list. Jumping to Square now, as there are a few things to cover in their segment once again. Of course, the Pixel remaster of Final Fantasy VI has since released on the 23rd of February, so fans of this classic are hopefully enjoying their time with it. In terms of other retro titles, Square's president has also said that they want more of them to receive the same treatment as the likes of Live Alive, which of course was shown off in the previous Nintendo showcase. Square have a massive list of 16-bit classics, so that's an interesting development to keep an eye on. As for the more modern iterations, there will apparently be more information on part 2 of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, planned for reveal later this year as part of the 25th anniversary of the original's Japanese release. According to producer Yoshinori Kitase, he says that they wish to share information within the next 12 months, as according to an article from the end of January. The free trials for Final Fantasy XIV have since resumed after the initial rush surrounding Endwalker subsided, so those looking to jump in will get a solid experience up to the end of the first expansion, Heaven's Ward. And moving away from Final Fantasy, Square have apparently trademarked the name Valkyrie Elysium. Now, that's by no means a confirmation on a new Valkyrie profile, it could be a mobile title for all we know, but that's something that caught my eye. And in terms of Nier Automata, it was announced on the 23rd that there will be an anime adaptation of the famed action RPG. As of now, we only have a small teaser featuring 2B, no information on a studio or plot structure, but it will be cool to see how this materialises in the future. Now to Gust, and despite Atelier Sophie 2 just releasing, we'll start with Blue Reflection Second Light, which as of the 31st of December had sold 120,000 units worldwide, a fair achievement for a relatively niche franchise. As for Atelier, the lead up to the release of Sophie 2 saw producer Junzo Hosoi being questioned about English dubs, a feature that has been omitted from Lydian Sewell onwards, and naturally that's no different for the latest iteration in Sophie 2. Hosoi has said they would consider bringing a dub back if the fans requested it enough, but whether that's just lip service or a genuine call to action, who knows. From what I remember though, Kui Tecmo do have a habit of stating things like this and not following through on them regardless of the support, but we'll see. Now on to Bandai Namco, starting with Scarlet Nexus. The game's producer in an interview from early February stated that he would like to work on a sequel with a more mature theme towards the psionic powers. Scarlet Nexus was definitely a standalone adventure, but it left a few open-ended plot points, so there's certainly potential to expand on the current mythos. As for Tales of, we knew that there was going to be a figure of Dohalim, Alfin, and Rinwell, and now we're getting one of Shion from Spiritale, based on one of the DLC attires. Now, I personally would have preferred the original outfit, as I think it looks excellent by itself, but hey, that's what Spiritel have gone for, and it's cool we're actually getting one. No prototypes have been shown as of yet. In regard to the 30th anniversary of the series, though, the producer has stated that he would like to make something exciting in commemoration of it. Specifically, he mentioned that he wanted to provide a wider range of Tales of titles and experiences for consoles while also developing newer ones as well. He also reiterated that he is not ignoring requests for ports or remakes of past works, which follows on from the statements made last month. Now to the upcoming releases. Let's start with AI The Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative, which now has an official release date of the 24th of June in the West, along with a new story trailer. 
The original hybrid visual novel was a positive, albeit niche experience, so hopefully this one will perform strongly. Pre-orders are open for this. Relayer, which is due out on March 24th, got a new trailer showing off gameplay in particular. It also launched a demo on the 25th of February on the PlayStation Store if you want to get an early taste. Now on to Digimon Survive. The hybrid visual novel has seen its fair share of delays over the past couple of years, but it looks like development is finally making some real headway. As part of updates from Digimon Con on the 26th of February, chief producer Kazumasa Habu answered some key questions about the game. He reiterated the development of Survive is now going well, with many of their technical problems behind them, which is a good sign. As for the game itself, it's confirmed as having a 70% text and 30% gameplay split, which seems about right for a hybrid novel, and the multiple routes clock it in at around 80 to 100 hours for all of them. It will also see a localization in French, German, English, Italian, and Spanish. On top of that, there was also a new trailer for those interested. In terms of other releases, there will be an Indie Live Expo from May the 21st to May the 22nd, which will be of high interest to me. I love myself some indie games and you can find some real gems within them, so I'll be looking into that when the time comes. You can keep up to date by revisiting around that time. Next on the list is a mobile game, and normally I don't focus on these too much as I'm not really an advocate of them, I think there are too many gacha style titles, but every now and then a seeming rough diamond emerges from the rock. And this appeared to be one, though unfortunately it's confined to Japan at the moment. Developed by the combined efforts of Key and WFS, who are known for Clanad and Another Eden respectively, we have a turn-based RPG called Heaven Burns Red, which launched on February the 10th. It's very much one of those girl power type of games, but hell does it look right up my alley. You've got a large cast of characters, excellent music by the sound of it, and a focused narrative. This looks like a game that would do really well on the Switch, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed for an English localization on this, though I couldn't find out if it had gacha style elements within it. Moving to another game that's already released, it's Neptunia X Senran Kagura Wars, which we knew was coming to multiple platforms after its initial foray to PlayStation 4 and now we have an official date, at least for one of those platforms. It's coming to Switch on the 19th and 22nd for North America and EU respectively, with a PC version to be announced soon after. A more niche title here, but no doubt one that has garnered a positive reception, Voice of Cards The Forsaken Maiden was announced for PlayStation 4, Switch and PC, and has since released on February the 17th. It's the second game within the series following on from the initial release back in October 2021, which is basically a turn-based RPG with all the elements shown via cards. I can't speak from experience, but a lot of people seemed pleased when this was announced initially, so I can only assume it's a good one. Disgaea 6 Complete has been announced for PS4, PS5 and PC via Steam. June 16th will see the initial release in Japan, followed by a North American, EU and Australian one soon after in summer. This version includes all of the previous character and cosmetic DLC from the original that released in 2021, and naturally also has a limited edition available for pre-order via the NIS America website. Finally, back on the 17th of February, there was some activity from Atlas. They launched a countdown website noted as Soul Hackers set for four days, and on the 21st they announced Soul Hackers 2 for PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series, Xbox One, and PC, launching on August 26th worldwide, and an English dub will be made available. Japan are also getting a 25th anniversary limited edition for PS4 and PS5, with a 30-track music album, 100-page art book, and some DLC, including crossover with Persona 5. A trailer detailing the characters in introduction to the story was also released at this time. Now, the original Soul Hackers released way back in 1997 and was the second game in the Devil Summoner subseries, which in of itself is a part of the wider Mega Ten universe. The only localised version came on the 3DS back in 2013, and as the name suggests, this is the sequel. So maybe there's another game for you to add to your list before the eShop shuts down. And there it is guys, the February news roundup for 2022 is complete. Hope you have a good week, and hopefully I will have another video for this weekend.